Yalimadot, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Norshan Nanji, and I will be moderating tonight's webinar. I'm the member for Special Projects and Health Professionals Engagement for the Aga Khan Health Board for British Columbia. By profession, I'm a registered nurse. I work for a startup company called Thrive Health. I'm the creator of Canada's official COVID app, so I work on a lot of their content. I also work on the neuromedical unit at Royal Columbian Hospital. I'm so excited for tonight's webinar, as I'm sure you all are. Tonight, we will cover one of the hottest topics in healthcare today, as we discuss the future of artificial intelligence in healthcare. I'm so honored to invite Dr. Mamad Mamdani to share his knowledge with us. If you haven't had a chance to read his impressive biography, I'll give you a quick rundown. He is the Vice President of Data Science and Advanced Analytics at Unity Health Toronto. He's a professor in the T Department of Medicine of the Faculty, sorry, in the Department of Medicine of the Faculty of Medicine, um, the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the Dalla Faculty of Public Health. He's also the director of the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine. Center for Machine Learning in Medicine, and in 2010, he was named Canada's top 40 under 40. So if that doesn't make you excited, I don't know what will. <laughs> um, so feel free to drop questions in the chat box throughout the presentation um, rather than at the end, and uh, we will leave some time at the end to go through those questions. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it on to Dr. Mumbani. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to share my screen um, and I hope everyone can see the slides. Uh, I'm assuming we can now. Um, today's topic is something that's actually, I think, fairly exciting and topical for a lot of people. It's about artificial intelligence. And, you know, there's a, a lot of um, fear and concern, I guess, around um, uh, how these machines and robots are going to be taking over the world. And I, I don't think we have to worry about that. But I'm going to go over artificial intelligence and its applications in healthcare. Why don't I flip on to the objectives? So uh, I want to keep this uh, fairly, um, uh, at a fairly at a level where a lot of us can actually really grasp some of these concepts. So I'm not going to be incredibly technical um in terms of the details here but i want to provide a basic overview of artificial intelligence or what i'm going to say is ai for short i want to provide a sense of our current state for ai and healthcare kind of what's happening right now in the field provide real world examples of ai and healthcare and then i want to discuss some implications of ai and healthcare more specifically for healthcare professionals and administrators but i'm hoping everyone can take some uh, uh lessons away from this talk so an overview of artificial intelligence. I want to step back a little bit and just make sure that everyone's on the same page, that we all have an understanding of what AI is. And I can tell you in my experience, you talk to some people and you literally think that they think it's robots taking over the world. And then there are other people who think, well, calculator is artificial intelligence, isn't it? Because it can compute things really quickly. And technically, they're right. A calculator is a form of AI. And I don't want to simplify it, but if we step back a little bit and think, think outside of healthcare, we've noticed a lot of changes over the past few decades. So, for example, I'm going to take you back 20 years. If you wanted to buy a pair of shoes, what would you do? I mean, you'd go into a shoe store and you'd try on some shoes and you'd buy them. If you wanted to buy a watch, you'd go into a watch store and you'd buy a watch. Well, a lot of people do retail shopping right now online. Places like Amazon have radically changed how we shop. And it's really amazing and even scary how it just knows what you want to buy next. So I don't know about you, but whenever I go onto Amazon, it suggests things that I actually really like <laughs> and I'm tempted to buy them because it just magically knows those are my interests. How does it do that? Well, what it does is it actually looks at millions of people's purchases, including yours, 
it looks at your history, matches you to others, and says, you know what, these 200 other people have similar interests. They bought this, this, and this. Maybe I'll suggest it to him. And there you have it. It'll make those suggestions. If we look at Uber, the taxi industry has been radically transformed by Uber. And of course, the Uber drivers are, are benefiting quite a bit from this, uh, this technology that where you can actually get a ride through your phone. Of course, self-driving cars are coming. And so then what will happen to Uber drivers? It's an interesting future because this is all going to be enabled by AI. And I'm going to touch on the self-driving cars thing in just a bit. Airbnb. So the largest hotel chain in the world, it's not Marriott. It's Airbnb. How is it that you can open up your phone and it will actually suggest hotels and or not hotels, but places and residences to go because it knows what your preferences are, because it's tracked where you've been. It just magically knows and you're more likely to actually then stay at those places. All of these things have radically changed business and society through technology, data, and arguably what they're using is artificial intelligence. So I'm going to step back again and say, well, what is artificial intelligence? I'm giving you the examples, but have I give you a definition? Not yet. So there are many, many definitions for AI. And a common one that everyone goes to, the almighty Google Dictionary. So if you look at Google Dictionary, the definition there is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision-making, and translation between languages. There's a lot of hype in, uh, in, with respect to AI and healthcare, and uh, you'll hear all sorts of titles in the media. So for example, AI beats doctors at cancer diagnosis. You'll hear things like, self-taught artificial intelligence uh, beats doctors at predicting heart attacks your future doctor may not be human this is the rise of ai in medicine artificial intelligence will redesign healthcare now you have to be really really careful because sure some of these are actually really neat uh, and uh, they're uh, uh, they're newsworthy but um, I wouldn't believe a lot of these, and, and I'll tell you a little uh, bit about why. First, I want to step back again and just talk about how humans learn versus how AI learns. So how do humans learn? Humans learn through data. And some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. No, we're not computers. Well, actually, we, we kind of are. You know, If you think about it, how do we learn? We learn. So right now, I'm learning because I'm, I'm actually staring at my webcam through my eyes, through sight. Uh, I'm hearing things and that, that tells me to be aware because there's something dangerous in the background. I can touch things and feel them. I can smell things and I can taste things. We have five senses. That's basically how we're ingesting all of this data. All of this data comes to us and we store it. Where do we store it? We store it in our body. So for example, when I'm seeing things, there's light, light waves, right? So these waves are coming into my eyes and they're actually being stored in my eyes, then they go up to my brain. When I'm touching things, the receptors on my fingers are responding. The data is being stored and then transmitted elsewhere. So I'm storing data and then I'm processing it. So how do I process data? Through my brain. That is my processing unit. So I'm taking all this information coming in from my five senses. My body's capturing all of this as a storage unit and then my brain is processing it. Now the challenge with humans though, is we can only process at the same time about seven plus or minus two things. It's not a lot. And there've been a lot of um, uh, studies around this. The classic one was by Miller in the 1950s who's a famous psychologist who basically was able to conclude that as humans, we can only perceive seven things plus or minus two, and then we start falling apart. What about computers? How do computers learn? Well, they also ingest data. Now, the trick here though is, 
in a lot of cases, it's data we give them. So we're basically their mentors, giving them data to learn. We can choose, do you want this data, that data, this data? It will learn based on the data we give it. Then of course, they store the data. They store the data in their servers or computers. And how do they process? Well, they process it through processors. Uh, GPUs or the graphic processing units these days are the things that are being used quite widely. And they process these data rapidly to make sense of it. Now, do they have the same limitation we do in terms of the seven plus or minus two role? Not really. Their capacity is limitless. Now, I do want to specify that it's humans who actually input that data often, uh, and that can be good and that can be bad. Um, the running joke right now is that the state of AI intelligence currently is that of an eight-year-old. And that may not sound very impressive, but it's an eight-year-old that never forgets anything, ever. And that, that is very, very powerful. So how do we actually ingest all this data, process it, store it, all that sort of stuff? Well, statistical algorithms really are the foundation of AI. That's what facilitates machine learning. And I'm not gonna go through this in any major detail, but there's lots and lots of statistical algorithms that take data, mathematically compute it. Uh, machine learning, for example, heavy based on matrix algebra. Um, there are all sorts of mathematical approaches to then process that data rapidly and spit things out that then make sense. That's really the foundation of AI is statistical algorithms. It's basically mathematics and algorithms. That's what's driving AI, but the foundation is gonna be your data. Now, the problems with human learning, clinicians have a data-driven mindset, but there's a problem. Clinicians and management leadership often deal with uh, very large, large volumes of information, and they have very limited time in decision-making. The average general internist, for example, They'd need to read about 17 articles every single day to keep up with the evidence, every single day. That was 30 years ago. 30 years ago, when we barely had internet, there were 17 articles that were published every day. Can you imagine the volumes now? There's consistent evidence also that we don't do a good job of processing all of this information because it's just too much. There's consistent evidence. I'm citing a statistic from 1998. There's more recent studies that are actually showing just the same, if not worse, statistics. There's consistent evidence of failure to translate research findings into clinical practice. 30 to 40% of patients do not get treatments of proven effectiveness. 20 to 25% of patients get care that is not needed or potentially harmful. So in many cases, we're not really doing our patients a service, not because we don't care, but because we have such a hard time coping with so much information, it's hard. So I'm gonna highlight this, uh, this whole issue of data and how machines learn and the importance of humans in the machine learning process. The example I'm gonna give is um, an experiment, a project that Microsoft launched a while back called Microsoft Tay. Tay is a chatbot. So basically, what does a chatbot do? It actually tries to communicate with people and through typing. So you can type it and it will respond. It'll try and understand what you're saying. The application was released to the public in order to be able to talk to people. The implications is that the bot will learn, the artificial intelligence bot will learn from humans on how to talk. So you can converse with it. It will learn, oh, okay, this is how humans talk. So now I'm gonna try and talk like a human. The input was data from humans. They first released it on Twitter, I believe. The output is learned conversations that mimics humans. What could go wrong? Well, you know, humans are not very kind and uh, we can be a little bit silly. So of course, within 24 hours, people on Twitter taught it to be racist, misogynistic, and many other things that I uh, shouldn't mention. Uh, it was really an awful, awful bot that was very offensive to a lot of people because people actually intentionally taught it to be racist and misogynistic. Within 24 hours, Microsoft pulled Tay out. It's a great concept and it would work, 
But as humans, we have actually taught it to learn the wrong things. And that, I would argue, is one of the biggest dangers of artificial intelligence and machine learning that we have today. So where are we? You know, uh, all these futuristic things, some of them we're actually seeing in other industries actually happening. What about healthcare? Healthcare tends to lag <clears throat> in a major, major way. So I can give you a quick sense of things, um, but I'm going to go back to this whole concept of, of data and why it's so important. If we look at the concept of a self-driving car, if we really think about it, what is a self-driving car? A self-driving car is a car with a whole bunch of sensors. So you got LIDAR, radar, sonar, uh, imaging, sorry, you've got GPS, you've got all sorts of, of uh, different uh, types of uh, things that actually capture all sorts of data inputs, right? So as you're driving, the camera's looking, it senses the distance of people. Uh, there's actually um, uh, voice and sound recognition in some of these systems as well. It's all of this information. Now, what they've done in a very smart way is they've actually said, in a disciplined way, we're going to have all of these data inputs. We're going to ingest all of this data and put it into one central place. In that one central place, we're going to have a very efficient, disciplined way of analyzing that data and making decisions. So it's incredible how the car will know because of its cameras, oh, you know what, there's a red light, so I need to stop. But my GPS says I need to make a right turn right after the green, uh, at this light, but I can't right now because I also see a pedestrian crossing. And it will make decisions within split seconds because they have a disciplined way of organizing, structuring, and analyzing their data. Now, why am I talking about self-driving cars and healthcare? Human body is not very different. In a hospital setting, for example, a person comes in, uh, we have lab tests, urine analyses, we've got medical imaging, temperatures, vitals. We've got data constantly being fed by patients. Our problem is this. We are nowhere near disciplined or organized to handle that data and process that data as efficiently as our colleagues in the automobile industry because they figured out you need that discipline. What is this thing I'm showing you right now? This is a schematic of a typical hospital, and it's St. It's Michael's Hospital, so I hope nobody's taking any pictures, but um, basically it's often a mess, and we're no different than any other hospital in the country. I remember a while back, uh, this is several years ago, when we were starting our initiative at St. Michael's Hospital and Unity Health Toronto, um, the first thing we had to really address was this data problem because in the hospital we have all of these different data silos. So we have our lab data that doesn't talk to our pharmacy data, that doesn't talk to our imaging data, that doesn't talk to anything. We also have lots of errors. In fact, if we wanted to know about a person's allergy, there are four different places that have allergy information and they don't agree with each other. So how do you know what's true? And how do you get all these data to talk? So this is the problem that we have in healthcare is foundational for AI. We need to get our data story right first. And there's hope because there's the digitization of healthcare. Many hospitals are still based on paper, but now there's a massive push. Gone are those days. We're gonna have even a bigger push in the future because how many people here are dealing with virtual care? I imagine the vast majority of you are dealing with virtual care. And I think in many ways, it's a good thing. It forces you to at least have some sense of digital footprint. We're also seeing mass adoption in electronic medical records. And I know some people hate the medical records. I'm not a massive fan of many of them either, but I do think it gives us some discipline to document much better than we were before. We're seeing things like Epic Cerner pop up in many different places. And that's on one, on one side, very encouraging. We're also seeing now people getting sophisticated and saying, hmm, all right, you know what? I'm getting a lot of data. Now I'm gonna set up my infrastructure. I'm actually going to actually look at other data sources. I'm gonna have tools that can actually glean all of this data and tell me intelligent things about it. So we're getting smarter slowly on how to use that data and we're creating infrastructure around it. If we look at healthcare decision makers, 
are we even thinking about AI? There's a survey of 200 US healthcare decision makers a few years ago, and the findings were actually pretty encouraging. 91% of respondents believe AI will be used in clinical decision support. 84% of respondents believe that companies who do not invest in AI will fall behind. And 83% of respondents believe AI will improve the accuracy of medical diagnoses. One third, more than one third of participants are already using AI. But for those of you in the audience who say, you know, I don't have to worry about it, it's not gonna affect me, I wouldn't be too sure. Um, I really see a lot of movement in this space and I think we're gonna be even more aggressive in the coming years. In fact, many uh, organizations and institutions are investing heavily in data science and artificial intelligence. Just a few examples. Uh, there's a multi, multi, multi-million dollar investment in the uh, Mass General Hospital and Brigham Women's Hospital Center for Data uh, for Clinical Data Science. Uh, it's a collaboration between Mass General, Harvard, and Brigham, uh, Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, phenomenal center in Boston. University of California in San Francisco has also started up a center that is dedicated to digital health and artificial intelligence. University of Aberdeen uh, Center for Health Data Science. The center that I started a few years ago at, uh, at St. Michael's Hospital, the LKS or Lee Cushing Center for Healthcare Analytics Research and Training or CHART here in Toronto, that's a formal center. We also have several AI research programs in many hospitals in the country. It's here, it is now. It's not something that's coming in the future. If you look at some of the concepts that are out there, um, and I'm saying it's here because we're actively working on it, doesn't mean that we've perfected it. We're far from that. Uh, and I, I shouldn't say far, we're not that far from that, but we still have a little ways to go. There are apps that you'll see that keep popping up. Babylon, for example, is one where you type in, you know, here's my symptoms, and it actually tries to process what you may have, but it also smartly suggests, maybe we should be talking to a doctor or a nurse practitioner or somebody to that effect, because I think you might need some help. Of course, there's an evolution here, in that uh, you've got other people doing similar things on a broader scale, like Sensely. You even have another push to say that I'm not only going to assist you with your symptoms, but once you're actually being managed and you're on treatment, I'm gonna get all this information in one place for you and you can actually tell me how you're feeling every day through an app or through some sort of uh, AI tool. And I'm gonna keep watching in the background to see maybe your treatments aren't working that well and maybe we need to go see the doctor again. That's happening as well. And of course, the bigger players are in this as well. Microsoft, for example, has been working closely with the National Health Service in the UK. Google has several had several projects um, with uh, healthcare organizations. This one in particular, Project InterEye, medical in imaging uh, AI to empower clinicians. Basically what it does is it tries to detect uh, eye disease through medical images. And uh, this is a wide scale project that has actually been implemented in the UK with some fairly exciting results. And you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not again in the past, or sorry, in the future, this is actually happening now. The quote here is by uh, the CEO of Cambridge University Hospitals National um, Health, uh, uh, the NHS, uh, sorry, uh, Foundation Trust. This collaboration between the inner eye team at Microsoft and the Department of Oncology at Addenbrooke's is an example of the type of innovation that we wish to promote within the NHS. It is a good example of what can be achieved when the trust works in collaboration with industry and the university in order to produce cutting edge technologies with real world applications in patient care to benefit the UK. Now it's not all easy because there are uh, instances, for example, Google had a pretty tight relationship with the National Health Service in the UK that didn't go over that well. There was public outcry that how dare you let public, or sorry, patient data be accessed by for-profit companies. There's all sorts of sensitivities out there. Now, it's not something we should stop. It is something that we should actually do ethically. We should do wisely. There are ways and it will take time to get there, but it shouldn't come in the way of actually advancing such an important field that can help so many people. So again, as I said, there are some failures and some challenges there. So if we look at the infamous IBM Watson, so IBM has spent hundreds of millions of dollars creating the AI um, uh, platform, IBM Watson. And it's infiltrated many different sectors, but they have had a bit of a focus on healthcare as well. Now, the intention of AI, 
uh, in, in, with respect to Watson was to be able to ingest information, process it, and provide recommendations to clinicians. Two hospitals in particular in the US, Sloan Kettering, and um, uh, there's, uh, there's one other one in, in uh, Texas um, that implemented it. They didn't have such great success because what they found was that the, uh, the Watson platform was actually giving them clinical recommendations that didn't make a lot of sense. So it kind of whittled down. The training wasn't really based on a lot of the data that the clinicians would normally want and see, unfortunately. There's another example where Google tried to implement a program in vision learning. So the concept here is they have an AI algorithm that can look at eye scans and tell you if there's a problem in their eye just by looking at the medical image. The problem that Google had is they trained their machine learning algorithms on the most pure, clean data, and it worked really well. It was so accurate. Then they implemented in the clinics of Thailand, in a busy clinic where the lighting is poor, where the machines may not work quite as well, and 20 to 30% of the images didn't even turn out that well. Good enough for, for a clinician to, uh, to view, but not good enough for an AI algorithm. And that caused a lot of heartache and pain for a lot of people. They stopped using it because it wasn't trained on the right data in the right environment. So we have to be really careful about how data science can fail. Now, of course, I'm using all these examples. I'm gonna actually bring it right to home. So what's happening in Canada? What's happening in my city, in Toronto? There's a lot going on. Um, so the case study I'm going to use is of Unity Health Toronto, specifically focused on St. Michael's Hospital, because a few years ago, this is where we developed our, our program. Unity Health is a compilation of three hospitals, St. Joseph's, St. Michael's and Providence. And again, a few years ago, Unity Health didn't exist and the focus was on St. Michael's. So St. Michael's Hospital is a tertiary care teaching hospital in downtown Toronto. It was established in 1892 with the founding goal of taking care of the sick and the poor of Toronto's inner city. We're one of two adult trauma centers in the greater Toronto area, 463 beds and numerous outpatient clinics. We have over 6,000 staff, over 900 physicians, over 1,600 nurses. This is just to give you a sense of the volumes of patients that we see. The approximate annual volumes, over 75,000 merge visits, uh, over 500,000 ambulatory visits. So these are clinic visits, outpatient clinic visits, and over 25,000 inpatient visits. That's a lot of patients. And we have data on over 11 years historically. So if you do the math, there's an incredible billions and billions and billions of data points that we have to work with. We also have a research institute, the Lee Keqing Knowledge Institute and Keenan Research Center with over 200 investigators and over 800 staff. And we're fully affiliated with the University of Toronto. So it puts us in a fairly nice position with an incredible amount of data and quite a bit of intellect in the uh, University of Toronto community. So what do we do here now? You know, I've seen a lot of groups just say, I'm going to build an AI development and research environment. And they build it. And that's what we did. But we had a bit of a different idea. What we did was we said, OK, let's actually fix our data problem. So we spent, uh, I think we spent over $5 million um, contracting with people to build a pretty top notch uh, data environment. Uh, and we outgrew that within a year and a half. So we're continually refining it and, and building it even more. We then brought in a whole bunch of tools to do the AI work. And then we brought in data scientists to actually do the work. And that's where people say, great, you've solved the problem. And I would argue we've only begun solving the problem. The problem here is you have data scientists who have access to really great data, really great tools, but they've never seen a patient in their life. How sensible is it for a data scientist to solve a clinical problem? Well, it isn't sensible at all. I would never want to go to a data scientist if I had heart palpitations. And I imagine as clinicians, you would never want to run a neural network. So the two need each other. And so while a lot of programs out there are really focused on building that AI development research environment, we said we have to pay attention to the application because the work we do can't just be focused on research. It has to have meaning to patients. It has to make their lives better. And where they live is chaos. And we have to embrace chaos 
it's not going to be perfect. We don't know when that next trauma case is going to come in. We don't know the mistakes that people are going to make, but they make them. The data is imperfect. And so we actually have to teach AI all of the imperfections of humans in order for it to be applied in the world that we live in. So our thinking was very simple. We'll bring in great people, great data scientists, create a really nice environment, but we're gonna force the two to merge. We're gonna force the clinicians, the management decision makers, we're gonna force all these people to work with our data scientists. We will create an applied AI uh, program via a living lab. And our rules are very simple. The data scientists do not get to ask any questions. The data scientists, the questions don't come from you. The clinicians, the administrative folks, the management people who make decisions every single day, they get to ask the questions. Now, they also have to commit to working with our data scientists on a very regular basis to be able to generate solutions to those problems. And so it works out pretty well, because as you can imagine, our clinicians and our administrative and decision makers, they have no idea about healthcare, AI, or statistics, or any of that stuff. But our data scientists have no idea about clinical medicine or physiotherapy or whatever have you. So typically what happens is um, the first meeting is often a mini med school for our data scientists, where our clinicians educate our data scientists. And the next meeting is often a meeting where our data scientists have a mini neural net boot camp where they teach uh, methods about machine learning and AI to our clinicians. And we jointly understand, oh, these are the assumptions you make. And oh, these are the things you actually have to deal with in your workflow as a clinician. So I have to change how I'm gonna actually develop my algorithms. And the two then work together with a common understanding to develop effective solutions that actually work. So why am I telling you all this? I'm gonna give you some concrete examples. The first case is in the emergency department. So our emergency department leadership came to us and they said, here's our problem. We often get lots of patients in the emergency department and by the time we figure out there's a massive amount of people waiting, we have half an hour to call in another nurse or ask the doctor to spend another few hours on their shift. It's just a disaster. And this is why people get upset. But if we knew days in advance, we could schedule a better. We could ask a nurse to come in Three days ago, we could have asked, uh, changed the physician schedule around. That would have been great. So they asked us, did you guys predict how many uh, emergency department patients we're going to have three to seven days from now? And we said, sure, I guess we could do that. So what we did was we actually took three years of historical data. Uh, now it's four years. Um, and we also grabbed weather data. So is there going to be a snowstorm tomorrow night? We also took city planning data. Are the Raptors playing at the Scotiabank Arena? Well, not anymore. Um, or is there a marathon happening on Lakeshore Boulevard on Sunday? And all of that information goes into our neural network-based uh, algorithm. And actually, it's uh, different types of statistical techniques that we use, but it is more advanced statistical modeling. And what it does is it regularly updates, and it tells you how many patients are going to come to the emergency department. So today is Tuesday. This algorithm, it's a tool that we use in the emergency department, and it updates regularly. It will tell you today's Tuesday, but on Thursday from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., there will be 82 patients in the emergency department. 10 of them will have mental health issues. 12 of them will be high intensity cases and the rest will be lower intensity and probably easier to manage. It does this with between 94 to 96% accuracy. And so what that does is it helps our leadership say, today's not a bad day, but Thursday is going to be awful. So maybe we should staff up a bit better. And Saturday, we usually, uh, is, is a bit busy, but it's telling us it's not going to be. So if somebody calls in sick, don't replace them because it's not going to be that heavy. And for the most part, it's actually quite reliable. So that helps with staffing purposes. Nurse resource team staffing. So our nurse team came to us and said, you know, here's the other problem we have is that we have this floater pool of nurses. So our problem from a financial standpoint is we have all these nurses, over 1,600 at St. Michael's Hospital alone. Nurses get sick, they go on vacation, maternity leave, paternity leave, short-term disability, long-term disability. What do you do when a nurse uh, doesn't show up? Well, what you have to do is go to an external agency and that costs a lot of money to get a nurse who's never been to our hospital before. That's probably not a great idea, but what are your options? Or you pay another nurse who just finished a shift over time. They're probably tired and I don't know, people uh, get a little bit, um, you know, it's not as easy to take care of patients when you're really tired. So the idea was create a floater pool of nurses 
where just their whole job is to relieve absences. So if somebody gets sick, you call this pool and they relieve them. If you make this pool too big, you're wasting money. If you make it too small, then you're still using a lot of agency and overtime and spending unnecessary money. Because to pay external people is time and a half to double time. But to internal people, it's not that expensive. So the question is, how big do you make this team? And our team, uh, our nurse leadership said, it's about 22 people. And we said, how many, how did you get to 22? And they said, it just, it feels right. And we said, it's probably not a good way to do things. So why don't we actually look at the data and see how many people actually did call in sick or take vacation and when? And sure enough, we found patterns. It's magical how your, the number of people calling in sick increases on days like Halloween and Valentine's Day, Mother's Day. All these patterns started coming about. And then we quickly realized we can actually, we can actually predict this. And so we're going to forecast out what will happen next year. And then we're going to feed this into an optimization model through an AI algorithm. And it will actually tell us you need this many critical care nurses, non-critical care nurses. This is the number. This is how much you'll save within seconds. And so we implemented the tool at two hospitals and uh, the estimated cost reduction annually is over a million dollars a year. Something very simple. Then we have something called ChartWatch. ChartWatch is um, it's, uh, one of my favorites. So this we implemented just a few weeks ago at St. Michael's Hospital. Our internists came to us and the internal medicine people said, here's our problem. One out of seven patients, uh, actually, no, it's one out of 13 patients. One out of 13 patients will either die or go to the ICU. And we don't know why for most of the, for many of these cases. By the time we realize somebody is deteriorating and crashing, we have about three hours to react on average. And that's not enough time. So if there's some AI fancy tool that can predict if a patient's going to die or go to the ICU at least 24 hours in advance, that would be really helpful. You can do that, right? And of course, our data science team says, well, if you partner with us, we can do it because we need to know where to start. You need to be our eyes clinically and we'll do a lot of the AI modeling. So now we have an AI solution and what it does is it does this all automatically. Every hour for our internal medicine patients, it grabs data on them, vitals, orders, medications, labs, all that sort of stuff. Every hour, over 100 inputs, uh, 800 uh, variable combinations, and it actually factors all of that in and it predicts if a patient's going to die or go to the ICU in the next 24 to 48 hours. Now, of course, that sounds impressive, but how well does it perform? Well, we spent quite a bit of time getting clinician predictions and we asked the doctors and nurses and residents, what do you think? Is this patient going to die? And we compared it to the algorithm and we can say we're at least 20% better in terms of accuracy than clinician prediction. In fact, I was at a meeting uh, just today with our internists uh, we've been reviewing it over the past few weeks. And this, this last week's review, we were just looking at the cases and there were three patients that were identified that unfortunately were missed by our clinicians. And upon further workup, there were some serious issues there that luckily we were able to catch. It's this sort of thing that I think we can generally help patients with. Last example I'm, I'm gonna talk about is an example around um, AI and medical imaging. So the issue here is uh, over 600 patients at St. Michael's Hospital just last year had a brain bleed. So you can imagine you come to the emergency department, you had some trauma or something's wrong, you don't feel right. They go and say, get a head CT and they find out that you're bleeding in the brain. Can you imagine how serious that is if you're bleeding in the brain? That's a very serious thing. Now, of course, how long does it take for us to figure it out? Well, by the time you go up to get your CT scan, to the time the radiologist actually sees it and says, I think we have a problem, is over three hours generally. That's common for most hospitals actually. That's a lot of time to be sitting there with the bleed in your brain. So of course our radiology team and uh, our data scientists said, I think we can do better. So we've created a platform, we've just finished silent testing on it for the past five months and we will be implementing it in the next few weeks. Um, the performance has been quite spectacular where this AI algorithm actually talks to our CT system and our PAC system, grabs the scans, runs through an AI algorithm, and within seconds, it says, yes, this patient has an intracranial hemorrhage, here's the subtype, and here's exactly where it's located on the image. 
and it's able to do this within seconds. It then feeds back to the system that the radiologist looked at, tags it, and reprioritizes it and says, hey, can you look at this now instead of three hours from now? And that we're estimating that when we implement this into clinical practice, it will cut turnaround time from over three hours to less than 10 minutes. And again, I think that's just better for patient care. If you can imagine, the applications are almost limitless, right? This is just intracranial hemorrhage. We're going to be working on many other apps, I guess you could say, that will actually diagnose other conditions like pulmonary embolism. We're thinking about uh, looking at mammograms. Uh, a lot of breast cancer patients often are in this anxious state of waiting days to a week to find out if they have breast cancer or not. That's really, really um, heart-wrenching for a lot of people. And if they could find out within minutes that, or even the same day, that would actually be, I think, good for patient care. Um, so it's these sorts of things that we talk about quite a bit at our center. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the categories. Um, so two of these examples are in under the prediction cal uh, category. So you can use AI to do prediction. You can also use AI to do optimization. And then the last example I gave around medical imaging is around automation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the realities in AI and healthcare. Example I'm gonna use is this clinical trial that was published. Um, it, was in, it was a European trial where the concept here is very simple. They developed a, a tool that would help clinicians within the context of febrile urinary tract infection. So the concept here is simple. You come to the emergency department, you've got a fever and you got a pain in your lower back. And of course, the thought here is, okay, well, do I admit this patient to the hospital or do I send them home on antibiotics? And this tool was developed to actually help you decide what to do. What they did was they took, a, I believe it was um, the 35 centers and they randomized the centers. Half of them used the AI tool and the other did not. And what they found, well, they actually had to end the trial early because of concerns of harm. What they found was in the arm that was using the uh, clinical prediction tool, they decreased admissions initially, but the number of people who came back because they had complications increased fourfold. And so they had to stop the trial. Why? The algorithm wasn't developed that well. The algorithm was based on, actually on uh, a totally different condition. It, it was uh, than, than urinary tract infections, and maybe that was part of the problem. Uh, but the implementation also was quite poor. I'm going to relate this back to the chart watch thing. You know, I told you about how we can predict death and ICU transfer, and that's wonderful and all. But, you know, it's it's a little bit worrisome because what if it does other things? Um, what if we get it wrong sometimes? Uh, what if it actually gets people worried and they send people to the ICU when maybe they, they shouldn't have? This is why we need to really rigorously evaluate it. So the, the programs that I'm talking about uh, that I've mentioned, they're always going through testing, through evaluation, to making sure that we're actually helping patients, not harming them. And this is why the trial that I mentioned just previously from Europe is so important, because if we hadn't evaluated it, we would have kept harming patients. Balancing performance with workflow. Algorithms aren't perfect, so AI is not perfect. It will get things wrong sometimes because the information you give it, because we're humans and we generate that information, information is imperfect. So it will get wrong uh, some of the things. The problem is how often does it get it wrong? And that's what you have to be really careful about. If it's wrong a lot and you perform better than the AI algorithm, there's no point in having it. How is it automated into the workflow? Are we triggering the AI to talk to the paging system or to automatically send you an email. And we have that for a lot of things where the AI actually determines, yep, I need to send an email to these four doctors and I'm going to do it now. All that's automated. It's done. We can do that. But is that, is that effective? Are there other ways that will actually uh, help communicate the findings of the AI? Privacy and transparency. So again, with this thing that predicts death and ICU transfer, who do you tell? Do you tell just the doctors and the nurses? Do you tell the patients? because then you could get them very concerned, but they have a right to know. Do you tell caregivers? Do you tell everybody? We actually had to consult with patients and ask them, what would you like? And that told us a lot of really important, useful things. It's not just a matter of just deploying these things. It's a matter of actually understanding the patients and the doctors and the nurses 
and the entire environment. In fact, the whole implementation of this chart watch algorithm involved over 50 people to get it right. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Of course, there's ethical and legal issues. So what happens if the algorithm says, this patient's gonna die? If the AI says to the doctor, this patient's gonna die, and the doctor says, don't worry about it, they're good, and then the patient dies, who gets sued? These again are some ethical and legal considerations that we have to, to consider around AI uh, implementation. And uh, again, that requires a whole different skill set. So implications for health professionals and administrators. Not everything needs to be addressed with AI. And I would argue in many cases, sometimes common sense is way better than AI because AI and machine learning have their limitations. If you give them garbage data, they're gonna learn in a garbage way. Microsoft's Tay will be the first one to tell you that. We don't want these garbage algorithms. High quality, readily accessible and timely data is a prerequisite to good analytics. End users need to be fully engaged throughout the AI development and implementation process. I can tell you that, that I see a lot of uh, AI solutions developed by non-clinicians who have never stepped foot in a hospital or into a clinic setting. Nine out of 10 times, they're not helpful because they don't understand the context. AI is not just about model development. There's considerable time and investment for successful implementation and maintenance. Again, over 50 people involved in the implementation of just one of those tools that I'd mentioned. And all AI solutions need to undergo extensive testing and evaluation. So when somebody tells you about an AI solution, or in the coming years, as a clinician, if you're actually considering employ, uh, deploying an AI solution in your practice, just make sure that there's a lot of good, rigorous testing and evaluation. Don't blindly adopt AI solutions without understanding their performance and their risks. In fact, just one other example is uh, when we were looking at our chart watch system to predict ICU transfer and death, uh, we looked at another system called NEWS. Now, NEWS has been deployed in over 75% of hospitals in the UK. It's a very simple algorithm. It's not really AI. It's just looking at vitals and a few things. Our clinicians outperformed NEWS, but we knew that because we tested it. And if we hadn't tested it, we wouldn't have known. And our clinicians would have been very upset because it wouldn't have given them a lot of good useful information. So, and again, it always comes with risks as well. AI often comes with ethical and legal issues that need to be carefully considered. So I hope I've given you some food for thought um, and I know we're at time, so I'm gonna end there and um, take some questions around this, uh, this fascinating topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mambani. That was super interesting and really informative. Um, we had a lot of really great questions come in. Um, so I'll start with the first one. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about how the healthcare system we have in Canada is not holistic. For example, often treats the symptoms rather than focusing on root causes. Um, how might the future of healthcare with more AI deal with this issue if they lack skills such as human experience and empathy? It's a great question. Um, you know, there's uh, one of the most challenging fields, in my opinion, is mental health. Um, and it's hard for AI right now to really understand emotion and be empathetic. Um, I do have to say that people are actually working on exactly these things. So for example, um, there was a hotel in, uh, in Japan where, uh, your concierge, your, sorry, your front desk person was not a person, it was a robot. And they had put sensors on the robot to actually look at facial expressions to listen for if the, if the um, person coming in is tired, if they've had a long flight, and it would actually talk to you differently based on how it sensed you were feeling. So it actually tried to empathize and it would say, oh, it sounds like you've had a long flight. I, I imagine you're really tired. Why don't I, I do this very quickly for you? And other people who seem very energetic, it would actually have conversations with. So I think it's evolving to get to that point. But I think I, I don't see it anytime real soon replacing the, the genuine empathy you get. And in terms of the whole holisticness of, of healthcare, I agree completely. I mean, we're not very holistic. Um, but I do think that AI has the potential then to look at the maybe not soft side of things, but um, how can we look at all sorts of combinations and permutations of your labs, your vitals, your meds, and get a sense of, well, what is this person actually suffering from? Mm -hmm. That AI can do, I think, much better than humans can. So I would suggest that um, 
bringing things together from a holistic standpoint, I think AI has a huge role in that. But showing empathy and relating to a person beyond the, the physical needs, which is a lot of cases, I don't think we're quite there yet with AI. We need some work. Not, not so much with mental health then, right? Yeah, uh, mental health is particularly challenging. And there's some very nice, encouraging advances, but I think uh, it's a tough one to do. Uh, it's a tough one to do for humans, right? For sure. Um, thank you. The next question is, if bots are learning from humans, for example, how to talk, who gets to decide that what they're learning is the right or wrong thing? Do the bots then reflect the views of their human creators? Are there not also ethical repercussions for this as well? Yeah, um, there's all sorts of uh, approaches to machine learning and AI. Uh, so for example, there's unstructured, uh, or sorry, unsupervised learning and there's supervised learning. Mm -hmm. um, with an eight-year-old, that's the intelligence level we have. I don't like unsupervised learning. Basically, what that means is you're basically telling the machine, go learn on your own, you'll figure it out. Where supervised learning says, no, I'm going to put some boundaries around you and I'm going to put some rules and I'm going to tell you what's right and wrong. I think that's where we are right now um, is more in the supervised learning space. Uh, the bots will learn according to what it's fed. So again, think about it. As a human, you're, you've got all these senses, right? You're ingesting things and you as a human will end up being racist and misogynistic if you're raised that way. Same thing with an AI algorithm. It's gonna depend on what you feed it. So who decides what a bot's gonna learn? If you put it out in the wild, the wild will decide because it will just adapt. Makes sense, yeah. Um, the next question is, how do you see the role of technology products that we're all hooked to, for example, the Apple Watch, the iPhone, uh, playing a role in the development of AI and tech? Um, and is there a particular product that you find useful for a consumer right now who's looking to improve their health by using technology? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, technology is just, I mean, it's all around us, obviously, but um, I think there are, um, there's lots of roles for tech. I think, um, especially with the younger generation, we're addicted to our cell phones. And, um, uh, you know, when we have our virtual visits, that's a great platform for ingesting data. But also, um, we're seeing more and more adoption. It's still, I think, really poor, but more and more adoption around these apps where you can monitor your health. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing watches, so a smart watch like, like this. Um, it will actually measure your heart rate. It will measure all sorts of things, uh, your, your blood oxygen. Um, there's all sorts of advances that we're making at that end. There's uh, the Aura Ring that a lot of the athletes are using and actually tracks COVID symptoms, you know? Wow. All of that is there now, and it's only mm -hmm. going to get more. So where I see wearables going is um, we're still going to have a lot to learn from them, but it's very strong. Um, the Apple Watch, for example, is a classic case, which a lot of now other the Android type watches or Google uh, Wear OS type watches have mimicked. You can actually detect heart problems um, with, uh, with an Apple Watch. Uh, it's only going to get more and better, I think. Um, so it's, it's a huge space. Yeah, for sure. I think um, the Apple conference mentioned a lot of really great updates to the Apple Watch today, like O2 sats and things like mm -hmm. that that you mentioned. Completely. Um, the next question is, thinking ahead to a time where AI is seen as a partner in the delivery of care, what advice would you give to educators of our future healthcare providers to better prepare those caregivers to be able to continuously adapt? That's a great question. I would, uh, number one, say have a critical eye. Uh, there has to be a level of trust. And um, the, the way to get tr to, to trust is through education. So I would suggest that people who are in the role of education learn about it. You've got to learn about it. Because I think uh, we see a lot of people talking about AI, but if you don't understand the basic mechanics of what AI does or what it's composed of, I think you're gonna have a really hard time and you're gonna struggle. So uh, for example, I, I'm at a teaching hospital. You know, we, we teach folks all the time. And actually just recently I uh, was named a director at uh, the U of T Center for Machine Learning. And uh, our whole focus is on how do we actually get people to understand what machine learning is because it is becoming a part of what we do. 
there are things where, so you'll learn things like, well, what do people, uh, what statistical approaches do people use? And I, you don't need to be a statistician, but having a basic understanding to say, oh, so the data that's being fed, it actually processes this way and it actually has an error rate of X because all models have an error rate. What does that mean in terms of false alarms or how many patients is it capturing from a statistical standpoint? Well, that performance is awful. I can do better. Let's not listen to it. You need to have that level of savvy. So it doesn't have to be that you need to know hardcore matrix algebra. But what you need to understand is how are these formed, these algorithms formed, how do they function and what do they spit out that's relevant to you? So I would strongly advise uh, people uh, who are educators to learn as much as you can about the mechanics of an AI algorithm, uh, specifically on implications for clinical practice. Um, I think that's a good segue into the next question, which is in the research environment, we're taught to not data mine, as in we're supposed to have a hypothesis that we test by looking at data. Are AI algorithms and the data analysis an example of data mining? And if so, is that really a bad thing? It's a great question. So um, uh, the epidemiologists in the crowd will, I think, uh, jump on this and and I one, one of my backgrounds is in epidemiology so I get where you're coming from. The concept here is we're supposed to have a single hypothesis that can be tested with a single primary endpoint. One thing, does this do yes or no? I would argue that if we look at the concept of randomized trials, let's say we have a thousand patients that you randomize, right? 500 to treatment A, 500 to treatment B. What you get out of that trial is the average person of those 500 in treatment A did better than the average person in treatment B. But what it doesn't tell you is, you know, there are lots of outliers here who actually did the opposite, but on average, one looks better than the other. And then we're supposed to take that information and apply it to our patients. The other problem that we have with a lot of modern approaches is that we exclude the vast majority of patients that we would normally see in practice because these studies have tight inclusion exclusion criteria. So generalizability is very poor. If you're a patient, do you want a doctor to say, I'm going to treat you as an average? Or do you want a doctor to say, I'm going to tailor my specific therapy to you as an individual? The differentiator that I have is that while trials have to be done, and I fully believe in them, AI, if done right, will tailor to the individual because it will actually factor in all sorts of considerations for that one person at that time. And that's much more powerful from a clinical standpoint. Now, how do you actually evaluate the AI? That's when you put it through these, uh, the primary uh, the hypothesis testing approaches with singular uh, types of approaches to evaluation. That's where those, I think, too fit. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, see, we only have two minutes left, so I'll just end off with one quick question. What books, movies, podcasts do you recommend to anyone who wants to learn more from this topic? And then I think we'll end off after that. It's a good sure. takeaway. Um, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of uh, good materials out there. I think uh, for people who actually want a, a less painful way of understanding concepts in AI and machine learning, Google actually has a great crash course in machine learning. So if you type in Google crash course in machine learning, it'll come up. It's actually quite good. Um, another one that I would recommend if you want to get a little bit more detailed into it is um, uh, Professor Andrew Ng's course at Stanford. So uh, last name is NG, Andrew Ng. Um, he's got phenomenal material, uh, very thoughtful, and it's a, a free course. You can pay for a certificate if you want it, but it's it's actually quite good. I'd recommend those too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the informative session. It was really interesting to learn. Um, that's all the time that we have for now. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening, um, and we do hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, everyone. Got him with us. Yeah.